That was a perfectly good rant, and I really appreciate the perspective. I, I, I just, I just don't look at things that way. I yeah. look at them from my seat, and yep. it's just a little bit different. Um, so, two percent of people have coaches, but there's millions of coaches I feel like out there. Mm -hmm. Um, what is the deal? What is your perspective? You clearly know what you're doing, have had success, mm -hmm. but what about the people that, for lack of a better phrase, bring the talent down because they do coaching as a side gig and they suck and they charge $100 an hour? So um, there's a whole mix up in coaching right now. And I know uh, even in the last three months, I've had so many people reach out and say, I've decided I want to be a coach. And sort of like everyone wants to be a coach now. It's like, like clients? Uh, like not to say my clients, oh, but I've, I actually have had one of my clients become a coach and she's excellent. Went to NYU and she's like just super gifted at it and has got a, and I refer her a bunch of business now. Um, but but I, uh, uh, you know, a lot of other people are just like sort of like, I've decided I wanna help people, I wanna be a coach. And some people probably could be great coaches, mm -hmm. right? But one, although the coaching market is growing, I think it's growing like 20% sort of, you know, you know, per year, which is huge. Mm -hmm. There's still it's a small market and a fixed sort of market, mm -hmm. um, and you're seeing sort of the the uh, bastardization of coaching. Like we we're talking to a company that's that's using uh, our software recently, and they were like going to do these like three packs of coaching with different people, uh, which is not coaching, right? Like you had coaching sessions, but it's like, it's not a punch card, right? This isn't, you're not, it's not lattes or acupuncture or whatever. Like it's, you know, coaching is from my perspective, it's a, it's a, you know, sort of a, you know, longitudinal, you know, time-based relationship. Yeah. And with any behavior change, it takes time. So, you know, a lot of employees, you kind of cheat them because they think I'm going to sit with someone and they're going to tell me the answer and give me a plan. I'm going to go do it, mm -hmm. which is not how careers happen, not how behavior change happens. Yes. And so now I see coaches online and a lot of online platforms where it's like you can talk to someone, buy a session, buy a thing. And if that's a way to like get started and get them into a longer relationship, I understand that and how people sort of try before they buy and whatever. But um, that seems to be more like, oh, I have a coach. And then you, you're like, yeah, I, I meet with them twice a year or, or something. And I'm like, it's not really a coach. Maybe that's like an advisor or a mentor. But like the coaching is like Serena Williams has a coach and she's not on the tennis court a day a year, right? And that's the reason she's a dominant star, right? It's because she gets a lot of coaching, right? And so, that, so when I see like this flood of people, and also it's kind of the new outplacement I've been told is a lot of people are saying, oh, I was a, you know, a, a VP of uh, treasury at a company, so now I'm gonna be a coach for people yes. in finance. Yes. But what they, re they were probably a damn good VP of treasury, but they're a piss poor coach. <laughs> yeah. In particular, if they don't get education or, or have the natural kind of aptitudes, or oftentimes they've never even had a coach themselves, right? Um, that's something to definitely be suspect is, a lot of people don't ask that, but you should ask a coach if they had a coach, because if they hadn't, like, next. I've said psychologists have psychologists that they talk to. And there's a special <laughs> group of psychologists that help psychologists, because that's like the extra strength. They're like really, you know, and the coaches that help coaches are also the same way, yeah, right? I, like, I, I believe in that. Yeah. Like you have to be a practitioner as well, right? Yeah. Like you need to be able to receive it. And totally. that's a really, really good point that I think is very overlooked. And that's a good tip for a lot of people who look into it. Now, uh, I know you're in the middle of something, but tell me why you think it's only 2%. Like, I, I, it took me a while. Yeah. And, and I'm like, the investment is worth it. Yeah. Uh, and and uh, the person that my wife and I have, I mean, he's fantastic, but it took forever. Now, clearly, there's a money factor. Like, sure. Oh, uh, wow, that's that's pretty high dollar. And sure. It's just kind of a, like a lifelong contract yeah. type thing, which is fine. We're okay with it. But why is it 2% and why do people suck up their pride and not want the help? Well, you know, uh, there's. it's interesting. Even the 2% that get it, if you talk to coaches who work with larger companies, whether it's paid for by the company and things, um, in my experience and the experience of a lot of other coaches that like the flake rate on like people not showing up to a session, having to leave a half hour early, not doing their work, needing to reschedule a ton of times is very high. So even the people that get coaching aren't necessarily always using coaching. So the actual percentage of people actually being coached effectively is probably less than two, right? And so first structural is money. It's expensive, right? So if you think about like that $500 an hour, according to Harvard Business School, that's the median cost of an executive coach in America. And that was as of like three years ago, it's probably gone up, right? Yeah. And you know, you don't buy an hour from a coach. A good coach is gonna say, hey, it's gonna be 20 sessions, right? So then it's 10 grand, 
right? And then that's the commitment up front. Well, that's a lot of money. So first there's the economic hurdle, right? Second is coaching is delivered in a, uh, a method that's sort of antiquated in the fact that it's, you know, someone you're talking to me on, and now like it's innovative because it's like over video and you can video come. Well, sure, like, and I've coached people over video too, and that's fine, but, but it's still the same thing, yeah. which is basically it's an hour of time, you're face to face or video to video, but it's banker's hours. I don't coach people at 10 o'clock at night. Yeah. I don't coach people on Saturday afternoons, mm -hmm. right? And most you know, top tier sort of executive coaches work banker's hours. The best coaches don't work on those other hours typically. Mm -hmm. uh, some people have different lifestyle constructs and they, they like doing that or that works for them and that's awesome. I think that's a market opportunity for certain people. Yeah. But you know, so you, so you coach during these rigid times that are high opportunity cost times because for a high performer, Banker's hours are times that you're selling, you're coding, you're interviewing, you're delivering, you're leading, you're financing, whatever the thing you do is, you're having to take away time to go get coaching to do that. And you're forcing them the context switch in the middle of the day. In context switching, each time you go from one thing to another, it takes 25 minutes for your brain to reset. Part of the reason people are exhausted is they're just going from ping to ping to ping and they never get into flow, right? Wow. If you talk about authors that ever write a book and they're effective, there are no alerts, the phone is down, no one can interrupt them, they just do one thing, right? And that's how you beast out a book. Wow. Or that's how great programmers code, right? It's how great video editors go through things, you know? That's how great artists get paintings made, you know? And, and they, they monotask, they do one thing. Well, you know, coaching has you, in the middle of the day, you're having to, you know, context switch. And the third thing is, is it's often too much medicine for the patient. Now, you and your wife, you have a military background, you served our country, you're doing something now totally different. This is not what you did in the military, <laughs> no. right? Like you're using different equipment, yes. right? You know, and there's different asset management and different things like that. And you're thinking in a totally different paradigm, right? And so, and, and you're managing a business and you're, you know, partnering with this WeWork thing. You've got these other ideas and you're, so you have a lot of complexity to handle and a, a lot of things that I would say are sort of like unstructured and ambiguous. Yes. So a individual coach is, is going to be better for you, mm -hmm. right? Because you have a lot of, but the average employee doesn't have that. Mm -hmm. The average employee has a job and they have a pretty common kind of 80, 20 set of you know, issues and challenges and opportunities. And so like with my company, the reason we're able to do it through software is our software can't solve for every permutation that you have. That's not, you would not be our customer, yeah. right? Our software is for when MetLife is our biggest customer and they've got, you know, uh, sales, you know, brokers and they've got people in leadership and people in their learning function and marketing, others, you know, uh, Aon or CBS or Thomson Reuters, Pandora Radio, all these companies we work with, and they have great, stunning, amazing people that do very meaningful work. Yeah. But what they really need to manage are some pretty common things, yeah. right? They need to manage how they use their time. They need to manage what their unmet needs were. You talked about unmet needs earlier. They need to identify what those are and do something about it. Mm -hmm. They need to manage their relationship with their manager and to make them successful, treat them like a customer and own their supervision yep. and manage up and lean into their preferences and style and have empathy for them as a person. They need to be effective at solving problems. Almost every job today is a problem solving job oh, and no one is taught how to solve problems effectively generally. The STEM industries and, and academic disciplines teach you a very structured way. It can be extremely amazing. Mm -hmm. But outside of that, often not. Military does a pretty good job of solving problems because of the situational adaptation mm -hmm. given the kind of dynamic environments that, that our, our service members are in. And then you think about like, how do you actually interact on a team and what's your role and how do you d you know disclose that and come up with that? Or how do you use technology to manage relationships? Like no one's talking about that. that's in our coaching product, but like that's the thing that everyone's deals, you know, feedback is on every engagement survey. I want more feedback. Well, here's the problem. People expect feedback to land on their desk. They expect it to come from their manager. They expect it to be part of a formal system. And then they confuse it with, you know, critical developmental feedback affirmation and recognition or confirmation of status. And those are three different things. If you're looking for affirmation and someone gives you critical feedback, you're gonna be really upset. Yeah. And so, you know, and thinking about their career as a portfolio and other things they can do inside and outside of their firm, right? In the community, right? Uh, in their association, industries, you know, whatever it may be, functions. And so that's where we look at the approach and say, for coaching, 
you know, most people go to a coach and that's why maybe two or three sessions is fine because they just want to talk about a couple things and that's it. Mm -hmm. But sometimes you have people do what I call like, they, they reach for their dessert and not their vegetables, right? <laughs> and what they want to talk about isn't what they necessarily need to talk about, right. right? And that's why a good coach, you know, if you go to Barry's boot camp or do something else, they're not like, hey, what would you like to work on today? They're like, get down and do push-ups, <laughs> right? And does, do people want to do triceps? No one really likes triceps. I but told like, my coach I was going to choke him through the phone once. Yeah. This is like after knowing him for a month. Yeah. He goes, I don't don't care he goes that's dirty toilet water or something and I was like what and I, I know it was kind of crazy I mean he's he's yeah. been in the game for a long time and he's like you don't understand that's not giving you immediate value and totally like, and I was like okay and then I calmed down and sure like we talked but yeah I mean you're you're exactly right I want to ask another question though so the the two percent is probably less and whatever the flakes so in your situation, because you have a software and flake rate is amazing. I love that you said that. That's hilarious. I have a pretty bad flake rate with uh, with things myself. I'm just like I don't have time for the call. But anyway, so in your because you have software associated, you are able to. Are you able to avoid uh, th these kinds of things? And it's just a better. I, I really believe customer experience is, is, is always number one, but yep. like your experience has to be good too. So when those people get those calls like, hey, I didn't do this or I got to cancel, it's, it's just like you're less invested in the relationship. Yep. So did that play any part uh, into the software? Yeah, I mean, one of the things we look at is, uh, is a measure the efficacy of our software is participation and engagement with it. Yeah. So, you know, the thing about the gym is if you go, it works. And having a gym membership isn't enough. You actually have to get your ass to the gym. Mm -hmm. So coaching is the same way. Hiring a coach. That's what I, I had to screen early on in my coaching practice. I would get clients that would buy coaching and not use it. Yeah. And not use it, like, either not show up or not be coachable. How do you but, not take that person? So, so I had to, like, I, well, I, I, my, my bigger thing was how do I screen that person out? And I had some clients that I had to fire. Awesome. And then I scream, screen it ahead of it rather than me like have to deal with it much it's like this isn't what I'm up for like I'm, if I was a surgeon I wouldn't like walk into an operating room and have people like I don't want surgery I'd be like screw you let's not have people in the <laughs> operating room that don't want to have surgery right like this is what I do right if you don't want that that's fine but this is what I do so so when you talk about behavior change and you talk about sort of a psychological contract there's a variety of things we do on our software to make people act to make it effective and have people actually use it and you know if you look at completion rates of like online courses, it's very low. Less than one percent. It's and if you look at talent development programs online, the completion rate is more like five to eight percent total, and our completion rate is about eighty percent over a fifty-two week program. Now, how do we get that? First of all, we have an advantage of pre-selecting. Employees don't give our product to their worst people. Yes. They invest in their best, yes. which is rare because a lot of times, you know, the worst employees get the most attention and the most money and the most whatever. Yeah. And we say, hey, you know, if you're picking stocks, don't pick losers, pick winners, mm -hmm. right? You know, let them fall off the vine, the bad ones. Focus on the winners, right? Because, you know, a high performer can have 10x performance of a low performer. And so, so first we have a predisposed group of people yeah. that, you know, that then we psychologically contract with them. Here's what we're expecting. Are you opting into this? Here's what you're going to get out of it because most talent programs that are sold and things that are sold in HR are marketed to the person buying them and writing the check, not the person using them. Yes. So we actually started as a direct-to-consumer company, and so that's the brand stuff. That's all the other things. So when we design something in our product, it has to be equally compelling to the buyer and the member, or an yes. end user we call member. We hate the term user. So, um, so, so buyer and member. And so we say, like, do they care and do they care? Yep. So, so it's like relevant things where there's a clear what's in it for me, a with them for both parties, right? Then we take, if you think of change management and you think people are at point A and you want to get them to point B. Well, the first thing you do is you assume good intent and you take all the barriers out of the way, the things that would get in the way. So that's friction. So friction is what? Is it on mobile? No, friction. Do I have to be on VPN? Friction. Is it buried 18 clicks into the internet? Friction. Do I don't know what my password is? Friction. So our product is a frictionless product. <laughs> People use it on any device, no software to install, doesn't matter what operating system, through text message and email, no credentials to log in, works anytime, works anywhere, right? Yeah. So we take the barriers out of the way yeah. and we hold people accountable. So if they don't do it, we let them know that we're watching them. So the Hawthorne effect, right, says just merely by people knowing their performance is being observed, it increases the performance. So there's a study in like 1940s of, you know, uh, like if they change the lighting in a factory, if people would be more productive. And just by having people with clipboards watching them, performance goes up, right? <laughs> yeah. So they know that we're watching them, yeah. right? And our team texts them, emails them, and calls them 
on a weekly basis if they're behind and we have incentives to get caught back up and we're trying to get power. And this is not something we've completely figured out by any means. This is a growing experiment because I want to get that 80% number. One, I want to sustain that number as we yes. grow because it could actually degradate. And I want to increase that number, right? Mm -hmm. And so then as part of that commitment, and then the other thing is like, we just really sell them on the excitement and how special it is to be invested in. Employees are always bitching about not having enough development and their companies don't care for them and all that. And then they get us, okay, here's the thing. Your company has actually heard you and they're doing something about it. Mm -hmm. Take advantage of it. And we make them feel guilty if they don't, <laughs> right? And we, and, we, and we start with, and we also make it fun. The first thing you do with a pilot is we make a playlist and we text everyone. We say, hey, what's your work jam? What's the song that gets you jacked up and gets you to get all this work done? And people go nuts and they're like blasting back all, you know, and it's like everything from like super explicit songs. That we have to find a non-explicit version to like Taylor Swift or something in between, you know, and I'm like, you know, and so, but it's whatever it is, right? And it's part of diversity and self-expression. And we put together a Spotify playlist for that cohort. That and that's the first thing. So we add just a little levity and fun where they're like, oh, this isn't gonna suck. Or this is like kind of refreshing or kind of fun. And you know, and we get into again those practical sort of things, but that's where it's. I look at it as our job. We're we're fundamentally we may be an HR technology company. It's a coaching product, mm -hmm. but fundamentally, if you were to say like fundamentally, what are we doing? It's behavior change. Mm -hmm. So it's it's in service of maximizing potential. Yes. Traditional talent matrix is performance and potential. When you evaluate talent, everything in the market's performance. It's all about performance. Most of it, by the way, doesn't work very well, mm -hmm. and employees and managers hate it but nothing's in the potential space. Yep. So we're on the potential axis, mm -hmm. right? I think it has a performance impact as a secondary impact, but ultimately it's to change behavior. Well, if people don't go to the gym, they don't get their results. So we actually, rather than just say, well, you know, the people that show up, they're gonna get a great workout. We actually look at it as our responsibility to get them to the gym yep. and to have them have a great workout. Mm -hmm. And if you look at people in like public health and that do case management and people that are in, in education and helping underserved communities and marginalized populations, they look at the same way. They take a sense of total responsibility mm -hmm. and wrap around the needs of that client or that patient completely, right? So you may be managing, let's say, HIV in the community, right? And you think, oh, let's get them the medication to manage their HIV and the thing. But maybe what they need is actually the bus ticket you know, in the bus yeah. pass to get to the doctor's office yeah. to do the blood work, right? Or maybe they need someone to give the medication every day because they don't have stable housing mm -hmm. and they don't have a place to keep the medication, right? Yeah. Or they're chemically dependent and they might sell it on, this, on the black market on the street. So there's, so you have to look at it in these sort of like, like non-logical but highly humanistic and related ways of like, what does that take? And so I would say that we are just getting started in figuring that out. I would say while we're industry leading, the bar is extremely low. On net promoter score, the, the range of scores is negative 100 to 100. And it's answering the question, how likely would you be to recommend this product to a friend or colleague? And so a zero is generally a good score, yeah. right? <laughs> um, USAA, a bank I'm sure you're familiar with, yep. is got one of the highest NPSs, uh, and it's in, it's in the mid 60s because okay. because it's just like you said, like you'd well, recommend it. The right? customer service is just it's awesome, it's, it's, right? I mean, they always just talk to me, yeah. for a little bit. And totally, I was like thank They're you. They're human, right? Like unbelievable. They have that nail. So they're in the 60s, right? Yeah. And that's where they're at. The talent management average for talent management software is negative 57, okay? <laughs> that's how bad the software is that's out there. Um, we're consistently scoring about 80. So between 60 and 80. Now again, early on, a lot of excitement, so we gotta protect and keep that, right? But it's also that psyche is like they value it, mm -hmm. right? It's something that they want and they appreciate. And we talked to uh, a new customer yesterday and they were like, well, should we like require this or whatever? And I'm like, if something is compulsory, it sucks. I have to take out the trash, I have to floss, I have to pay my taxes, it sort of sucks. You still have to do all those things generally, yeah. but, but if something is compelling, you wanna do it, and it's in a totally different part of your brain. So I said, let's not make it compulsory, let's make it compelling. Let's, though, have people opt in and commit, right? Rather than have it be compulsory, have it be a committed thing, and say, by the way, if you do this, we expect you to do this. And if you don't, we may pull you out, and we use loss aversion, is another way, because people are really motivated. Like, it, they, they don't want to lose that thing, yeah. right? So they say, hey, like, you know, you're behind, like, let's get you caught up or whatever. But you know, by the way, if you're just gonna like ghost or check out, we'll pull you out of the coaching cohort. You'll lose the coaching. Oh, got it. I'm just like hearing that, I yeah. would 
be like, no, 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 don't take, 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 take that's what I want, I'll, I swear to God, I'll do it today, I'm going to sit down, I'm going to binge it, I'm going to do it all, you know, and we have people do that, right? Yeah. And, and not as a, is, is a, is a, like a, you know, a threat, but just to say that there are consequences if you don't honor your word and meet your commitment. Yeah. And again, this is completely foreign to how most HR and talent programs are run. So, so the socialism of HR is everyone gets everything. There's no... Uh, segmentation or gradation, you know, everyone's the same, which is just not true. Employees in a, in a, in a room know that there, are, you know, some people are higher performers and harder working and more talented than others, yeah. right? And that's okay, right? You know, a baseball team pays players differently, yes. right? <laughs> yeah. And that's okay, right? And, and so, so that's where we're trying to take some different approaches. And so when I share all this, we're in a place of learning. We figured some things out, but we have more to figure out than we figured out. Mm-hmm. Right? I'm, I'm like just superbly impressed. Uh, this is far deep. This, like I could tell you from being a, to a lot of talent management, HR conferences, panels, and everything. Like it doesn't get this deep and intentional. Sure. Um, so I'm I'm just finding myself not surprised by some of the scores. And and the thing is, even though you say. Even though you say, you know, the average is negative 57 and you guys are in the 60s and 80s and it's still kind of new-ish or whatever, you're mm-hmm. still the tip of the spear. And the way you operate, and I'm sure the rest of the company operates, like, you are going to just be just, un- un- you know, like, you are just going to rush to try mm-hmm. to get, not rush, but intentionally work towards 100 no matter what. Yeah. And while it may not, may not happen, like sustaining yeah. is, is super relevant. And like just the Spotify playlist alone when you said that, that's just like, okay. Like if someone did that for me, just as mm-hmm. an individual, I'd be like, well, all right, like, thank you. Or get your attention or, or have you be curious or be like, this is different because again, the brain is a pattern recognition machine. The tiger is running at it, you have running at us and it decides, is it gonna kill me? Should I fight or flight in the amygdala fires, right? Yeah. That's how the brain works. So the brain is a computer, and when you see the talent stuff that always sucked, and it's delivered in the same way that's always sucked, you assume this is gonna suck too. So you have to interrupt the pattern and say, this is different, and it's gonna be cool, and then you actually get the people to pay attention and be open. And if it's as simple as a freaking Spotify playlist, and we've got a ton of other things that we're doing around that, right? But like, you know, that's these kind of inspired ideas. It's the, you know, part of good design, is truly at the root it's thoughtfulness yeah right it's it's you know it's less about the zhuzhing and the joie de vie of all of it it's it's or that's not the right thing um the right term even uh let's rewind that but <laughs> but the zhuzhing of it um but uh it's you know it's it's really the thoughtfulness and saying like wh- where is this person sitting what's their view of the world what are they thinking and feeling and hearing and seeing and feeling and and what do they need right and it's almost like a good person that gives a good speech starts from that place. Less of what they want to share and more about what the person in the audience needs. Correct. Right? And I think that's where we're, again, we have so much to figure out and so much to learn, right? Um, it, we're constantly experimenting. We get things wrong. Um, you know, we, we started, you know, we've had a lot of shifts in our company over the last few years, but it's exciting to be in the place of like, how do we be in service, mm-hmm. right, of this and create ultimately beyond, you know, right now we're positioned as a coaching company. It may be in two years, five years, 10 years, some period of time, we are a self-management layer mm-hmm. that is over and with the employee. We are the, the sort of thing that helps keep people sort of straight in their pocket, right? Independent of their manager, if they're good or not, yeah. independent of their HR, performance management process or systems, which all can be additive mm-hmm. in tailwinds, yeah. right? But that basically say like, let's create that entrepreneurial sense within a person, right? That has that sense of ownership, responsibility, agency, and empowerment Mm -hmm. that says, huh, I'm going to command my career and I'm going to be in charge. And my experience of work, my employee experience, as everyone talks about at conferences these days, and in my employee engagement is actually my experience in my engagement, and I am the one to be the world's leading expert to know what I need in an experience and what I need in an engagement, which is different than her and different than him, and that I'm actually the one to shape that. Yeah. And it's not a top-down, one-size-fits-all program or something that's you know, four branches, and are you a this, this, or I'm none of those, right? Diverse workforces, we all come from different walks of life and need different things. Well, this ties back to something very, very important for me personally, um, which is... 
a long and and I'm so glad you and Claude connected. But a long time ago, when she and I were just talking on LinkedIn, we'd have a monthly call. Maybe she said to me when I was complaining about my my job, and you know, I was just like, I can't believe I'm complaining about my job. This, <laughs> this is crazy. Like my family's okay. Blah 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 blah. But I just wasn't satiated, you know. Sure. So she goes, "You're more in the driver's seat than you think." Totally. She's like, she's like just believe me. And then I was just like, "What the hell does she mean?" And then mm. sometimes that leads to see you later. You know, yeah. like. And my and sometimes so that's the eject the eject right you know yeah I mean and my wife's just like it's time yeah I'm like I was like so validated and I was like okay so so this goes back to what you were saying about you know the kind of cyclical nature of recruiting where it's just like you're just circling in the same pattern you know yep. uh, to the next job for maybe ten percent mm -hmm. more or whatever mm -hmm. but what if you're not even in the right job now yeah you know what I mean so I think. I think shedding light on the individual's capability to to completely navigate their own career yeah. is probably something that is just not discussed. Often. No, like, no, this is crazy to and, me. And, and yet, it's so fundamental. And everyone looks at someone else. It's amazing when we talk to people about our software. They're like, they think it's like a magic eight ball. Wait, you're going to tell the employee what to do? I'm like, no, we're going to hold up a mirror so the employee can figure their own shit out, yeah, right? Yeah. And that's what a coach does. It, the problem is when 2% of people have coaching and you're out there selling a coaching product, people think it's training, learning, mentoring, advisory things. It's none of those things. It's coaching. A good coach does not give you the answer. Yeah. A good coach helps you facilitate your thinking mm -hmm. to come up with the answer.